Pete, how are you? Hey, Ryan, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. We were just chatting about uh, kind of our journeys uh, coming into this uh, road where we're both kind of helping people grow the value of the business to figure out how to create choices and exit. And um, I think this is going to be a fun podcast because <laughs> literally we both were in the trenches and now we know what it's like on the other side. So for the listeners, why don't you just give us a huge like overview of like the, the, the things that you've done, some of the milestones and what you're doing now, and then we can take and unpack all the different uh, d- different parts of the journey. Yeah, absolutely. So like you, um, I exited a business. Um, in fact, I've exited four businesses and I've got two that are current right now. One is called Ask My Board, where we help companies grow at scale and potentially exit. Um, and then I also am the CEO of an online voting company based on blockchain, which is completely two separate things. So we can, <laughs> we can chat cool. about that separately if you want to chat about it. But um, those are the two most active businesses. My last business that I exited was a consulting firm based in and around SAP that I sold to KPMG about five years ago for 12 times EBITDA and no earn out. And I'm happy to kind of we'll unpack that story a little bit because I think mm-hmm. there's some very interesting lessons there for a lot of your listeners and other entrepreneurs. And that was my fourth exit. And the other three were, I had a business process outsourcing company, I had a software reselling company, and I had a car leasing company. And so I've done a ton of stuff. And what's interesting is I, I also worked for SAP and executive management for about seven years. So Part of the value that we bring as a company and kind of a lot of the learning that I had is um, we talk to tons and tons and tons of companies. And whenever you are with or you work with an ERP uh, firm like SAP, Microsoft Dynamics, whatever it is, you get into the guts of how a business operates, right? And that was actually pretty cool about that career is, mm-hmm. you know, you, you see a product on your desk or on your shelf and you're like, hey, I wonder how they make this, right? And so we <laughs> would literally kind of get into the, the nitty gritty of from manufacturing to production to procurement to financial, to whatever, like the whole gamut of literally how everything is made. And what was really interesting about that career and in my SAP consulting business is you see these companies, big companies that you have a lot of respect for, and they're making a lot of money. And then you get into the weeds and you're like, my God, like, <laughs> how, how are these guys doing this? Making <laughs> any money? Like they're so screwed up, right? Um, and so anyway, so what you all kind of, that's, that's my overview. We can kind of start to pick apart any, any one of those stories that you want to talk about. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and especially with some of the things that you're doing now, when you're talking about the, some of the techniques of actually diving into the sophistication of like how you're applying that to the valuation growth, which I think we can, we'll, we'll kind of put a pin in that and go get down there uh, at some point towards the end. I, I want to, before we do that, I, I want to understand how or where along that journey, Pete, you understood or had this shift in mindset away from what we, what we call annual income. So many people are just solving for top line revenue, net income, perks, distributions, and then they just do it over and over and over again. Do where in that, in that it was it exit one or five or, or, or four, or was it like even before you started to become an entrepreneur that you understood that this thing is a financial asset and we need to grow it? in order to actually have options where along the lines did that kind of start to come into play for you? Yeah, it was, it was definitely not the first two companies by any stretch of the imagination. And my, my first one, I would say I exited by the skin of my teeth. I I didn't make a lot of money. Um, Long story there about car leasing, but you know, that was my, even though I have an MBA, that was truly my real business MBA. About (laughs) That was the real tuition payment, right? (laughs) Right, exactly. Right. And it was, you know, so I always kind of treated it as even though I made pretty much nothing on the exit, um, the learning in the, in the time that I owned, it was just priceless. I, you know, that was basically a million dollar MBA. The second exit, I started to kind of get a little bit, it was more a uh, passionate business. And so I was more to your point, annual income and just all the traditional metrics and traditionally running a company. But when I got an exit and got a little bit of money out of that, I'm like, hey, you know, Maybe there's something here. Maybe I need to kind of think a little bit differently. Then my third exit, in terms of the the ownership of the business, I became, even though I was an operating CEO, I, I let it managed it very differently than the first two. I, I viewed it more of a financial asset, to your point. And even though I didn't, I probably left a million dollars on the table in my exit, I was still able to exit for the third time. And as you know, you've been in this business a long time and you had your own exit to get three or four exits. It's pretty astounding. 
And so you got some right, bridges there. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, just, I mean, very few business owners get the chance to sell a company ever, right. Let alone three times or four times. And so, mm -hmm. so not only was my, my, um, the way that I viewed running that business very different than the, the previous two, but I also learned a ton of stuff during that exit. And all of that were essentially learnings. All those scars and bruises I have on my back were great learning from my fourth exit. And so, you know, if you if you understand valuation multiples for services companies, 12 times EBITDA is beyond ridiculous. And then let alone no earn out, right? Let's and just put it, let's just pause there for, say it again. <laughs> 12 it's, times it's, EBITDA and no earn out. And you know, I'll, I'll kind of, we'll, we'll kind of pick apart that uh, story a little bit, mm -hmm. but you know, I, I didn't do that by accident. That was learning and leaving a lot of money on the table for my previous three exits. Um, and, you know, you can read books, you can have a coach, you can have a mentor, but until you really go through it and really understand, you got to manage the business while you're going through it, like all the stuff that kind of goes on, you, you know, you don't necessarily have that, that perspective. So. Well, and I didn't do it by accident. I mean, that's the opposite. I mean, that's the exact same thing as intentional, right? And I, and I think right. about it. Let's talk, let's talk about what are some of the things like when you, what was the mindset when you started that business? And, you know, maybe explain what your mindset was, why were you starting it and what were you guys doing? Yeah. So um, this fourth business was an SA, was a consulting business, a systems integration business around implementing SAP, the software. And I mm -hmm. had um, left SAP as uh, an executive management there. Um, a lot of people that leave the big software companies, they immediately go to a business partner. Um, and then, you know, we call them rebounds to some degree. And I, <laughs> I purposely didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be one of those guys that went and just, you know, was an SAP partner. Um, and so I left the industry, the ERP industry completely. I was a COO for a software company thinking that that was going to be my next kind of big deal, signed a phenomenal executive management agreement. And then five months, six months later, I found out that I hated the CEO Long, long story there, but I quit. No job, no nothing. I just, I was that miserable that I just mm -hmm. said, I'm in a bed on myself. I'll figure this out. Left the company. And then a lot of my network that kind of knows me, a bunch of people started reaching out saying, you know, hey, what are you doing? And um, the uh, former chairman and CEO of a company in the SAP space reached out to me and said, look, I, you know, I've got, um, I want one more bite of the apple. I've got probably another six years until I retire. You know, do you want to be kind of my operating guy? I'll put some money in. You put some money in, and we'll we'll go do this thing. And um, at the time, you know, kind of back to your mindset, I was like, yeah, I don't want to kind of go back into that space. But because of my third exit, I'm like, you know, just it's a financial asset, right? And I can do some other stuff and and kind of treat it as that. And so that's how I approached that that business. Um, both my co-founder and I, he uh, I bought him out about five years later. At the top of the market, he got the absolute premium valuation, and that's when 2009, when things just went. And uh, so great no, timing no. on his part, and he got 14 times his return on invested capital. So he's was very happy with me. In fact, he was an investor in one of my other companies because of that. And so, and then I ended up selling it to KPMG just a couple of years after that. So. When, when you when you view it as a financial ad or when you view it as you know still you know kind of deep in the weeds of an operating CEO but you you have a um, you're not necessarily building it to sell as John Whirla would say right mm -hmm. but um, what, what what we did as a company is we said look let's just go build a really highly valuable company because when you do that, you have lots of options, right? You can do an ESOP. You can sell it back to the, the employees. You can do a management buyout. You can go public. You can do whatever, right? You have, mm -hmm. you have tons and tons of options. And nobody could predict five years out, three years out, you know, like SPACs. I mean, mm -hmm. even though they existed, nobody thought about a SPAC a year ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, we're, so we didn't try to pretend any kind of an exit strategy specifically. We said, let's just build a fundamentally super valuable company generates cash, it's got recurring revenue, has very loyal employees, has blue chip customer base, on and on and on and on. And then we'll have lots of options. And that's mm -hmm. essentially what happened. So, and, and I love it because I, I, I want to pick that apart because I think like you said, the the scars and bruises you had from the first couple translated into more intentional on this one. And and before we get into the kind of the tactics of like how you got the the, four, the 12 times and the, the lack of earnout and the, what, they, what you did operationally, I want to start Pete with. 
your mindset and you know i'll give you a, a quick little uh, couple comments about this what i see of the the people that have been on the show is like you either have they think you have to like marry your identity with this business and that's you have to give it all your soul or you have to be some cold you know investor with an arm's length i believe that there's a way to do both and i'm curious like what what strategies or how did you do that where you're able to build the culture and build a business that has the same values as you but also know that this is an asset is there anything that like helped you kind of keep both of those things in in the same you know within the same wrapper yeah that's a that's a really interesting question so this really went back to when I when this my co-founder approached me and said I want to do this again and I want to be out in five or six years. You know, we talked a lot about that and I said, look, when you build a company specifically for an exit, you make very different decisions, and employees get that and customers get that. They know whether you're going to grow and scale because you're going to do to do an exit, and so that then sends out a strong signal to any stakeholder that you're not in it for the long term. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I view that to some degree as an investment banking philosophy, right. Or mm -hmm. an, an private, equity, kind of philosophy, kind of, yeah. private equity, right. They're, yep. you know, you know, they're going to flip it at some point. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and people, people get that and they, they just, you, you attract very different people. You create a very different culture. And then the flip side of that is, you know, I said, look, I was getting up in age as well. I didn't want to do this for the next 12 to 14 years of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd kind of been in that space for a long time and didn't want that to be my total legacy. And so to your point, I was really nicely squarely in the middle. And so mm -hmm. what we ended up doing was within the first couple of months, we wrote this manifesto and this manifesto was what kind of company do we want to build? What is the culture? Literally kind of down to the values of the company. What kind of employees do we want to attract? What kind of customers do we want to attract? Um, the whole bit, it was about, a, I don't know, 15 to 20 page manifesto. Cool. We ended up having employees actually sign when they came in and said, this is what we're all about, right? Oh, cool. And what was really interesting about that is um, two, th two things. So kind of five years after we had started, we were updating the website and doing a bunch of stuff. And we said, you know, let's, let's kind of go back and let's pull the employees. There were 30 some at that point and, and ask them what the values of the company were, uh, you know, were at that point. And, you know, what I always tell entrepreneurs is those first couple of hires that you bring on board w will pretty much irreversibly set the culture. Right. And so you've got to be very mindful about what you do up front. Mm -hmm. And so, so we thought we had done a decent job of that. Uh, everybody had kind of forgotten about the manifesto at that point. And so when we pulled everybody and said, you know, describe the values, you know, kind of give us five or six or seven values, the collection of those values from the, those employees was almost identical to what we put in the manifesto. That was super cool. Is that just absolutely confirming what you, what you were doing? Yep, absolutely. So we were super proud of that. And, and I think one of the stories that probably there's a bunch of stories, just normal startup life, but I, I think that really kind of set the tone for the company was, um, I don't know, two to three years into starting the company, we had um, a potential client approach us that had a huge project, like a $5 million a year project. And they said, look, you guys have this particular skill set there really nobody else in the in the SAP ecosystem at that point really had. We are you interested in this business? And so, you know, go find me an entrepreneur that has a five million dollar contract per year that isn't interested in pursuing that, right? Anybody <laughs> yeah, would. Yeah, exactly. So to make a long story short, we actually declined. And they thought we were insane. And the reason we did is this particular company had a really bad reputation for just chewing people up. They just mm -hmm. treated people horribly, not only their employees, but any suppliers and vendors. And we were relatively small at that point. So it literally would have more than quadrupled the size of the company, but we knew that this core group of people we had was precious and that they mm -hmm. were, they were going to be the engine for growth. And if we just kind of put them on this project, they would, just say, what are you guys doing? Like, you must not like us, right? You must not respect us. Mm -hmm. And but more than anything, you're not living to up to the values that, you know, you wrote in this manifesto. So we turned it down and that sent a huge signal to everybody that we were living up to the values of the company. And that was, you know, uh, you know, whatever the, the term is, you know, one door shuts and another, another mm -hmm. one opens or the window opens, right? It just created this whole new growth curve for us, which was really interesting. It just fundamentally because... The employees said, all right, these guys are really serious about kind of living the values of the company. 
That's fantastic. And I'll tell you what the discipline that it takes to say no when you got a carrot. <laughs> That's even more than a carrot hanging right in front of you. And so you, you said that, you know, the couple, there's plenty of stories about the growth startup. I want to dive specifically into uh, consulting services, and professional services, because you know, the, the, the company that my dad and I sold was distribution. So copiers, and then we serviced it afterwards. And then there was managed IT services, which was a completely different business model. And so this story is going to loop back to a question. I promise <laughs> is that so what happened, Pete is, you know, my dad would sell when he started the business, he would sell all this gear that had margin that he was able to hire the technicians to service it. So scaling that business is a completely different working capital need and how you go about doing that. And then the managed IT is like, no, no, we have to hire like $700,000 worth of people, then go sell. And he's just like, what? And so the, the interesting thing is I have been scaling our own services company, Pete, is that I even said that scaling a services company, even though we think about our cone like a financial asset, but also with our, our platform and identity and all that is getting to this point. And I see the same thing with our clients where you have this fight for cash flow between the owner salaries, decoupling the owner. If, if you're not, if you don't have a product or some sort of flat rate contract, getting to the point where you're then able to hire the next round of people to continue to scale that and scale that flywheel. Does that make, I mean, I'm, I'm, there's a question in there, right? How did you go about doing that? How did you solve that? What did you take in those salaries? Did you have seed funding or would you, was it a product pricing mix that allowed you to, to get past that hump? You know, I, I, I would say we we started traditionally and then we transitioned from there and I'll explain that. So we started with the typical consulting model where you you find a piece of business, you find a person that has the skill set, you marry them up and you get a little bit of margin, right? Mm -hmm. And so we started with some seed capital, not a lot, um, found a couple of engagements. In fact, the first six months, I was a fractional CEO for a company that they were, <clears throat> excuse me, they were a construction firm that had a a digital product and they knew nothing about tech. And so I basically helped them build a business case, go get funding, that kind of stuff and did that as mm -hmm. a fractional CEO. And that was basically my salary for a while. <clears throat> and then that quickly kind of moved away from that. And what we ended up doing essentially is we would look at both employees, salary versus freelance contractors and kind of the market. And the decision we made was let's, we we morally said when you hire somebody you're making a five year investment. We just that's the way we felt. Okay, mm -hmm. so we would look at an individual with a skill set and say, do we think this person can bring a return every year for the next five years? If they had just a small skill set that seemed to be in vogue for that you know that during that time or whatever, mm -hmm. we wouldn't hire them. We we'd go you know hire an independent contractor or hire a freelancer. So because of that, you know, we kind of went from this mix of mostly independent contractors to some employees, and then it kind of went like this and it completely shifted the other way. Mm -hmm. And when we start, when we sold the company, we were like 95% full-time salaried employees, 5% independent. So mm -hmm. we, we made this shift over time, and that helped manage the cash suck that, you know, having a growing a professional services company has. And, mm -hmm. you know, and there were times where, you know, we needed, we had a, we always had a line of credit. We always used up that line of credit. I don't remember a time where we didn't, you know, and then you'd get these contracts in and customers would start paying and then, you know, you'd pay it down and then you kind of go back up again the yep. next month when people are sitting on the bench. And so, you know, there's lots of ways to get around that we could kind of talk about, but that was, that was essentially our model for the first yeah, five super years. Helpful. I mean, I, I, I've got clients that have gone through the model of like, Hey, I've got contractors on, but should we bring W2s on? And like, I mean, I went through that and we did a couple of contract CFOs, uh, uh uh, last year, and we just sucked up the golf ball, and we hired two full time CFOs W two, and it's like, oh, <laughs> get selling, and it's just so interesting being able to see that. And what I think is crazy important is like that that view of hey, this is a financial asset because like we wouldn't have been able to do that, or I know a lot of clients wouldn't if they were using the distributions for you know play you know playing in their lives. Which by the way, there's nothing wrong with it, but you're just making a trade off, and it, most people don't understand that there is a trade off. How are how are you structuring? Like, what was the engagements like? Were they annual contracts? Was it hourly rates or perm placement? Or like, how was, what was the engagement like with the client? No, no perm placement. It was they were medium to long term contracts typically. So anywhere from our projects were six months to could be a year and a half, depending on kind of what the nature of the scope of the agreement or the scope of the project was. We had uh, we had clients that even though it was 
you know, maybe a nine month contract, we would just find other projects to go on and on. And so, you know, we were, we were some clients for three, four and five years. Um, we had other clients that it was a smaller project. We would do some T and M time and materials. Most of the contractual arrangements were time and materials mm -hmm. uh, hourly, if you will, but they were longer term projects, longer term contracts. We had, when you put in an ER system, ERP system, there's typically this really big project team in the beginning. So, you know, we had one of our first big clients after two and a half, some years, we had 16 people on one project for nine months of which, and oh my God, there's tons of stories about that. But there was, you know, that, and that was two thirds of them were employees, were salary employees. Interesting. Um, Interesting. So, you know, margins are always much, much better, but cash flow sucks. And so as, as long as you Explain can that support for the, for the listeners, would you? Right. What's that? Explain that, that the, why you, that statement, would you? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in fact, we used to take our employees through, we would, we call it Finance 101 because we wanted them to understand the impact that, like, not getting your timesheet in so that we could invoice has on the company, literally. <laughs> literally. Right? So, you know, so if you think about it, if you're paying someone's salary, let's just say you're paying 10 grand a month, right, for 120,000 a year person, you're paying them every two weeks. So you've got 10 grand going out in the first month, right, just for that one person. And let's say you're billing them out at, whatever, a hundred bucks an hour, right? And so you've got, well, maybe not a hundred bucks an hour, but whatever, you've got, you know, that- I think that, it's about 160 hours a, a month. That, oh no, that's a yep. little, it's about 160, 150, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, so, you, so you've got the revenue that you're accruing on the books, but if they're a really good customer, you know, you're going to bill them, even if you could do two weeks out, you're getting your cash in 45 days, but most of the time you're getting your cash in 60 from the day that you start, right? So now you have two months of salary out until you get even a penny of, of money. Um, <laughs> yeah. we, you know, we had a, um, we had, we actually had a fairly sizable project with Apple and um, Apple's standard terms are 90 days. Of course and they you're, are. <laughs> you're lucky if you, you know, if they actually put 90 days in the system, they'll usually pay you in maybe 110, 120, oh right? Gosh. And it was funny negotiating with them because my response literally was, you guys are bigger than most banks in terms of the cash and assets you have on the books. Mm -hmm. You know, you're crushing small business by these terms. And so we ended up negotiating like 60 days, but which I paid 90 anyway. <laughs> but, you know, point being is, so, you know, that's, so the margins, uh, you know, in a professional services business for employees typically are significantly higher than an independent contractor, but it's, you know, you're consuming cash all the time until mm -hmm. you catch up. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, you know, you, maybe you have an independent contractor, a consultant that, you know, maybe you're still billing out 160 bucks an hour, but you're probably paying them at 120 or 140. And you can, what we would typically do with most of our consultants, some would just not accept this, but we'd say you're going to get paid two days after we get paid, right? Which was a huge incentive for them to make sure they were getting all their paperwork in on time or whatever mm -hmm. so that we could bill. Um, some, would, some would accept that or not. So that obviously helped out cash flow, but the margins dropped by more than half. And so mm -hmm. you just got to kind of balance those two, two things depending on what your growth strategy is. And when you think about, we kind of start out this conversation about valuation and, and the value mm -hmm. of a business, right? The value of a business that has a bunch of independent contractors is not worth a lot because anybody could go replicate that tomorrow, right? Companies are buying your future revenue and income streams. They're buying the intellectual capital of your people, right? And if these are not captive people in terms of being employees and it's not captive intellectual capital, it's just not worth a lot of money. And mm -hmm. I have this conversation with CEOs all the time that are trying to balance this cash suck with, you know, profitability. And then mm -hmm. what is, you know, to your, like you said, you know, they come to you and say, we got these independent contractors, should we make them W-2s? And my answer always is go find core skills that, you know, even if you could stick it out on a freelance site, if they're sitting on the bench for a little while, you know, you're going to get some money for it, right? It's a way better video long-term than just having what I always call a federation of independence. So oh, no, that's just I, I, that's super, super good insights. And I've personally lived what you're talking about. So I understand and I understand the pros and cons of each. Hey, kind of going back to, to the mindset, Pete, like what, when you were looking at this business with your partner, and then I want to kind of go like, as you were growing this and scaling, and then you bought him out, like when you two sat down and said, we're going to build this business, here's our manifesto. What was your definition of success? And like how, like, cause like the reason I asked the question is everybody's definition of success is different. And then also yeah. I think 
You know, a lot of entrepreneurs, Pete, we have this vision of what we want. And it's sometimes fuzzy, but we, we kind of know what it's going to feel like when we get there. And we get frustrated with this lack of progress. So it's like how like when you guys sat down and said, hey, this is what we're going to march towards. What, what was that like? And how did you define success? Yeah. So what's really interesting is my co-founder and I had very different definitions of success. His was, I want to be out in six years or less. And this is how much money I want to get out of the business. Mine was, I want to buy you out and probably have another bite of the, you know, have my own bite of the apple, uh, you know, my fourth exit, if you will, sometime shortly thereafter. But that never made its way into the manifesto. The way that we defined success in the manifesto was we thought fundamentally the consulting market in ERP was broken in terms of you've got the big guys who have this pyramid model who, mm -hmm. you know, they're charging 250 bucks an hour for a person just out of college. We thought that was broken, right? <laughs> yeah, um, right, right. And then, and yeah. then you had the, 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 the offshore companies that – would say, hey, they're, you know, there's only these guys are only 20 bucks an hour, and you can have five of them for the same price as you get one guy over here, right? We thought that was broken. And that was kind of the those were kind of the two different models mm -hmm. in the in the software space we were in. And so we felt that there was a good opportunity to do things differently, do things better. Just like every entrepreneur thinks they've got, you know, <laughs> the best idea. Doing things better. Yeah, this is the best idea ever, you know. And, and it wasn't <laughs> like that was new or unique, but we didn't think anybody thought was doing it in the spaces that we wanted to play in, in the mm -hmm. software space. So we define success as if we mostly by net promoter score, and we could talk about that. Mm -hmm. So we ended up having a net promoter score after four or five years of about 60, which is phenomenal in the net promoter score space. Um, and so that was the biggest definition of success. So we said, if we get all or the majority of our business from referrals from other clients, then we've we've done something right. We've succeeded that way. And if if we do all those things fundamentally, the financials will take care of themselves. And and they did. Super interesting. So that um so when you were, were when you and your partner, did you have an idea that you were gonna buy him out early before your second bite from the very beginning? Was yeah, that was yeah. that Oh, it was yep. so when did, when did every year when you got when you got to like the an, end of the year and you're like, hey, we made we made progress. What what were you defining as progress? And when did it make sense that it was the time for the buyout? Let me let me tell you a story. So we were in, in this. Honestly, if I look at ask my board, the the origin story, if you will, goes back about two years into that business. And um, we had hired, a, we had 14 people at that point, all full-time employees. And I won't go into this long story, but we had a project that um, our project manager was just blowing it. And the client called us up and said, look, um, we had, I think, eight people on this project, six or eight people on this project, and said, look, you know, this stuff's going on. You may not be aware, but because of this, you guys are out. We're, we're kicking you out of here. Not only are we kicking you out, but we actually don't think a whole lot of work was done over the last two months. So we're not going to pay you for, it was almost a quarter million dollars of invoices that they had not paid yet. Okay. So um, that was just, it was crushing. It literally just crushed the company. And we didn't Both have financially and because your reputation, I'm assuming, because reputation is just as important as the quarter million bucks. Exactly. Exactly. Right. <clears throat> and so I'll kind of tell you what we did after I tell you the rest of the story. But so and we really didn't have much of a pipeline. We had some pipeline and I was the guy that was responsible for sales. And so I had a very good sense of just because I've been doing this for so long, kind of where things were in the in the cycle, in the deal cycle. My my business partner did not. So we go out to lunch one day and we come back from lunch and he just was not himself. And we get into my car. It's a winter day in Cleveland. I'm here in Cleveland and we're sitting in the car and the car is warming up. And I look over at him and he's literally his hands are shaking and his face is kind of white. And I'm like, Nick, what's going on, man? And he said, uh, here. And he reaches in his pocket and he hands me this piece of paper. And I'm like, what is this? And so I unfold the piece of paper and I look at it and it's a spreadsheet. And so I'm looking at the spreadsheet and it was equity and distributions and all this kind of stuff. And I said, Nick, this is a going out of business spreadsheet. What do you, what, what's the deal, man? He goes, you know, you know, we just got, we just had to eat quarter million dollars of cash. We've got this huge payroll. We don't have the cash to pay for it. We don't have a pipeline, but he goes, I'm, I'm we're done. Like we're, we're toast. 
And and I said, you're you're crazy. Like we have these other deals, they're huge deals. This will more than make up for the cash, you know, that we just lost, whatever. It's okay. Like give me give me 30, 60 days. And he's like, I, I just think we're done. And it was a really bad, you know, we sat in my car for almost two hours. Um, and this was a very confident man who had done an IPO, like the whole bit, he was just shaken. So we went back in the office and I spent probably the next 24 hours and I built this, this growth strategy that didn't require any cash. And it really is kind of the foundation of what now we do and ask my board to a large degree. Cool. What ended up happening with this particular account is we had every legal right to sue this company and get that quarter of a million dollars. I called up their CIO and their CFO the next Monday after kind of they delivered the news, news on the Black Friday, as we called it. <laughs> and I said, you know what? We screwed up. You're right. We weren't kind of watching this thing. We get it. Um, not only do, and I actually, uh, you know, to set up this conference call, I kind of sent them an email and I said, open the email. And they said, they opened the email. And I'm not sure, I think they were thinking it was going to be a lawsuit, right? Mm -hmm. But it basically said, you know, we're writing off this money and we're canceling the contract because we screwed up. And they were blown away. And this, the CFO of the company said, we've never had a vendor treat us like this. I'm, we're just blown away how professionally you have done this. And the CIO at the time, the chief information officer said, you know, for a period of time, we can't, because they knew we had to do all these other service lines and said, we can't do anything with you for a while, but if you can just kind of hang on, like you guys just blew us away. We'll, we'll do business with you again. And I can tell you that we got more business long-term from that client than any other client we did business with, right? Which is pretty astounding. Um, they were easily, they easily referred probably 10 million bucks worth of business to us repeatedly. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? I, I, I absolutely love hearing that story. There was one in our old business, Banner Engineering. <laughs> we, we blew up a project. It was wrong gear. I mean, it's eight, like almost a hundred grand when we shouldn't have. This is back in nineties or two thousands and same thing. And it's just interesting because why is it that doing the right thing is so unique? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? So exactly. what I, I know people are probably thinking about the, uh, the growth strategy without cash. <laughs> so they're, I'm assuming they're kind of hung on that. So <laughs> I, my, my question for you is that like, as we continue to go down the, the, the path of the partnership bio and then the sale, and then like why there was no earn out in the valuation, but then also the growth strategies. How do you want to take those two paths? Because I think they're probably correlated. Um, do you want to continue going down the, uh, the the story and then we can get to the growth strategies without cash or or was that part of this uh, the next stage of the story? No, we'll, we'll go to the end and then we can always come back. So, okay, let's do that. So about a year and a half before we sold the business, I knew I was done. And I think most business owners, CEOs, entrepreneurs kind of know when they're done. And, you know, I think most entrepreneurs think they're done multiple times during the path when, you know, just everything's kind of being thrown at them. And they're like, I just want to throw white my flag, hand. White flag. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, God, I'm done again today. Right. But, but to me, and, and because I, had, again, I had other businesses that I'd sold, I, I knew that just stuff was going to be thrown at you all the time. But, you know, I, I just kind of hit this point where I'm like, all right, I, I'm, I've done what I can do. We've had great success um, and more focused on my employees that we didn't have a big enough sandbox for them to grow, to continue to grow and fulfill the things that they wanted to do. And I just kind of instinctively knew that. So the number one thing that I did, and I think this is going to be your biggest takeaway for your for your listeners, is, you know, this John Wierow talks about this owner's trap, right, where you are the mm -hmm. rainmaker, and I was very much a control freak. I was very much in control of the business and I was selling a lot of the business. And I knew in order to get the highest valuation in the best deal terms is I had to pull myself out of the day-to-day -day business. So I did that in a transition base. I didn't just wake up one day and say, hey guys, kind of the business is yours, don't screw it up, right? Mm -hmm. um, I started training some of our practice leaders how to sell. They were kind of went through some formal sales training. I did a lot of mentoring and coaching and you know, going on sales calls with them, but as kind of the sidecar, not the primary person. Mm -hmm. So over the course of a, probably two quarters, I started transitioning pretty much all the kind of fundamental business growth stuff away from me and onto the team. And as you might imagine, which always happens is they flourished, right? And the business flourished, which is always kind of a little bit of an ego trip, right? You're like, hey, we're going faster than we ever were and I'm not selling. What's going on here? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like I'm proud of my I'm proud of my little children and my baby, but wait, what about me? Exactly. What about me? What about me? <laughs> so, so and then and then kind of started the process of going through the sale. And when uh the the kind of the dance with KPMG was about six to, to nine months worth. And and I, I did two things in terms of kind of again lessons for the listeners. One is I really built this strategic narrative for KPMG, meaning I didn't focus on us, the business. I focused on what the business would mean to them, right? So for instance, they would go into clients and they would do the strategy work and they would say, you need to do X, Y, and Z. And then introduce this partner, they would go do the work, right? Well, we were getting 10 times the revenue they were. The strategy work was $1.00 we were getting $9, right? Mm -hmm. So I was able to build the strategic narrative with them to say, you guys are leaving all this money on the table. So for the size that we were in the book of business we had, if we kind of add that into the KPMG um, mm -hmm. you know, book of business, you can grow your business literally by seven, eight, nine, ten, ten 10 times, right? And so, and we'll come back to that in just a second. So, you know, so they, the, the senior partner that was my business sponsor totally bought into that. And so we start the process of going through due diligence, kind of doing. Do you have an investment that. banker that was representing you? No? Nope. Nope. Just what reached out on. And, yeah. Yeah. You know, in, in kind of in, in hindsight, I wish I would have had multiple bidders. I, I made them believe I did. I think they kind of knew that I actually didn't. But so I was kind of acting as my own investment banker. I probably mm -hmm. would have done that a little bit differently the next time. But so the deal was moving along and then it just kind of got stuck for a while. Mm -hmm. And. I could just kind of tell it wasn't moving forward. We weren't having the same number of calls per week. There wasn't, they weren't doing as much due diligence. And so I called up my business sponsor and said, what, what's up? The deal seems to be stuck. And he said, you know, honestly, I'm not actually sure kind of what's going on. You know, I know we're still interested and, you know, we, I'm like, you guys have, you know, we, I have the fourth largest auditing firm doing due diligence on my company, right? Like <laughs> yeah, that that's not intimidating at all, right? <laughs> like that concept, right? And everything, and I'm like, is it a due diligence problem? He's like, no, actually, you guys came out squeaky clean. And I said, well, who's ultimately making the decision? And he said, the vice chairman of KPMG. I said, great, give me a meeting. He's like, you want a meeting with the vice chairman of KPMG? I'm like, yeah, if you want to get the deal done, give me a meeting. I'll get the deal unstuck in 30 minutes or less. Trust me. <laughs> That's so, awesome. So uh, he gets the meeting, I think, a little bit, you know, timidly. <laughs> he wasn't sure what I was going to do. Fought in New York, meet with the vice chairman, you know, talk small talk for a little bit. And I said, um, this guy's name is Jeff. And I said, Jeff, you know, what's what's going on? The, the deal seems to be stuck. Are you still interested or not? Is it a valuation thing? Is it a deal terms thing? And he's like, the valuation seems fair. Um, you know, the business case has kind of been approved by the audit committee, whatever. He said, look, I'm going to be honest. He said, we've never acquired a firm. And we acquire, you know, probably 25 firms a year where the CEO is not going with the deal. Tell me why you're not going with the deal. That's what's sticking us. We hmm. just don't know if there's something that we're missing. You know, we who better to ask than you, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And so, and thank God I was prepared for this. And I said, look, I said, if you look at our last 12 months worth of business, I said, I can tell you the companies that became our customers because I signed the contract. I can't tell you any single individual that has their signatory on here or that's involved in the project. I said, I'm not the rainmaker. I'm not the guy who's bringing in the business. You don't want me. You want these other people. And I said, and I'm an entrepreneur. This is my fourth company. I will make a really bad employee and I'll <laughs> probably charge you so much money that it'll actually, you know, in negatively impact the ROI and the deal. You don't want me as part of the deal. I'm just telling you. And I literally can't tell you, you know, kind of who's responsible, you know, how, how kind of this business got done. And he believed me. And two weeks later, we closed the deal. Um, wow. And so, again, no or not. And that was a big part of it. And, and, and it wasn't just a bunch of BS. I, I had legitimately pulled myself out of the business enough that I could make that statement to the vice chairman. Right. Mm -hmm. And he believed it. And they, and they checked up on it. That's so amazing. And so, yeah, there was a lot of good gold nuggets in there. And I think one thing that I want to go back to, like with your 12 times EBITDA, Pete, is um, there's something that we talk about in our in our training. When I, and I love it, this framework just to think about valuations where there's like the intrinsic financial value of the business, right? So if it's a million dollars in EBITDA, you're going, what's the discounted cash flow? It's very, it's the very mechanical, like whether it's a bond or whether it's commercial real estate or a company, they're all looking at it from the financial value. And then there's the 
strategic, what I like to call the transaction value, because like there's the purpose of the deal. You have a buyer and the seller and you have an actual deal that goes through. Cause if it's a family transition, you're going to discount it, wrap it in your estate plan and whatever. But, in a, and what you did is very similar to how we sold our business. We didn't use an investment bank either. Kind of wish we would have. And the, the thing is what we did, we did the narrative too, but we were essentially backing into how they could make the investment or the purchase, even though it would be 12 times EBITDA, it ended up being like three to four times based on how they were going to, how they were going to deploy and make that return. Does that, does that make sense? I'm kind of curious. And like, how did you figure out what they were going to do and how to do it? How did you make that narrative aligned where they believed it? So prior to when, before we started the acquisition process, um, the senior partner and I decided we wanted to, uh, cultural fit was everything to me. I wanted to make sure that, you know, going from a smaller consulting firm to this gigantic KPMG that I was just not going to shock and kill my employees. And so the best way to do that is to go after a deal together. So we actually went after two. We decided to kind of partner on two two big deals, which really helped us figure out, are we aligned in values? Do we sell the same way? Are they a bunch of sleazy, slimy people and we're the honest people or vice versa, right? Whatever. We really kind of figured that out. And what I got out of all of that was this notion of they're leaving so much money on the table and they would get used to this, you know, the audit practice, right? Which is really high bill rates, really short term. And I'm like, how about if you jack down the, the, the bill rate a bit, but then you get a 12 month contract. Isn't that cool? Cause it's 10 times what you're getting right now. And so that experience of kind of partnering together, and even though I kind of just academically intrinsically knew that's how they went to market, really kind of going through two deals. They saw you do it, right? They didn't have to just believe it. it. Yeah. Exactly. And I, you know, the thing that I'm probably most proud of, the two things I'm most proud of about that sale was the one is the senior partner hit every, and I helped them build the business case. He hit everything on, he actually exceeded everything on the business case for three years running. Super and cool. so, you know, it's, so it was a very credible and, you know, and I jacked down some of his projections and, and, he made his numbers for three years in a row and he's gotten, I think he's had three promotions since then. Um, And that the cultural fit was an excellent one. And everybody had the opportunity to go grow their skills and, you know, KPMG had way more learning stuff and opportunities for leadership growth and that kind of stuff that we ever had. And everybody was pretty happy. And the only people Mm -hmm. that left was because they they didn't want travel anymore. That's so interesting. And I, I think it's something that like, and going interesting based on your comment about the uh, running a, like a controlled auction or something like that. I think like what you did is so similar to us. And it's like, you kind of go, well, you could have maybe done it differently, but would it have been worth the time and the effort because of how, how successful it was? But it's like, you know, you kind of leaving some of it up to chance, but in, at this point it's it's in history. But I think there was someone that was, uh, that was on my podcast, Norm Brodsky. Uh, he, yep. he had this one example where he's like, dude, if you just talk to these strategics for years, and then when you want to run a controlled auction, you can throw the strategics into the mix with the private equity firms and go, hey, I'm rooting for you as you hand it over to your deal team. I'm like, that is brilliant, man. <laughs> that is almost exactly what we did. I had created these partnerships with the three top SIs. That's awesome. They were in our space. And, you know, until KPMG, I'm talking to your two competitors. And this was kind of a growing space within the SAP marketplace. And so they knew that the growth rates were there. They knew that if they if I didn't do the deal with them, I could... Quarter yeah, walk yeah, across yeah, the and go send to the other one. Whether I actually, you know, ran that controlled auction or not, they didn't really know. Mm-hmm. But they knew that that was an option, they, and they knew that I had those relationships. So Norm is a hundred percent on the mark. You've got to, you've got to do that because you just, and you just never know. And the strategics, by definition, are going to see value in a deal like that that you know a PE firm is not going to, right? Mm-hmm. And it just. It's a way better deal. I'm advising a client right now who's kind of going down the path of he's got some strategics and he's got PEs kind of banging on the door. And I'm like, mm-hmm. hang off on the PEs for now. Let's get let's get the let's wet the appetite of these guys, right? And then throw them together. And then throw yeah. them together. I love it. So I know as we're we're getting a little bit close on time here is um two two additional topics that I wanted to kind of dive into is one is that I want to get to the growth strategy and some of the tactics and the things that you have seen uh, like the levers to pull. But before we do that, you you had mentioned when you started down the the deal train and getting out of the owner's trap, you said, I just knew it was time. 
I'm curious of what you meant by, I knew it was time. Was it energy related? Was it financial related? And why you, you know, in a profitable business like you are, why didn't you decide to, especially after decoupling yourself to just keep the cash flow machine and keep clipping coupons? What was the kind of your ready? How did you understand that it was time? It was a combination of a couple of things. I, I'm not very patient as a, as a person. And I just know when I kind of hit my limit, no matter what it is of, I know I'm not going to be able to get past the tolerance level of this thing. And I had accomplished everything that I wanted to accomplish in that manifesto in the business and was bored, frankly, more than anything Mm -hmm. else. And whether you're, you step back in your chairman and you're clipping coupons and letting the cash come in. I didn't think that was fair to the employees. And I know people that do that all the time. And that's just not me at all. I just didn't think that was the right thing to do for the employees um, that, you know, have this guy who really didn't care about the business anymore, just sitting back, clipping coupons and hoping the business runs well. Mm-hmm. And I think that for any chairman that wants to, you know, anybody that wants to step back and, you know, harvest the cash generated from the business, they still have to, in my opinion, they should still have to have an interest in it, Right. You may not want to do the day to day, but if you really fundamentally don't care and don't want to do it, in my opinion, like then sell it, right? It's just not fair to everybody. And I've seen the mental space of of even thinking about it, right? Like, I mean, yeah, if you would have said the word Canon copier to my dad, like six months after he's like, I just don't ever want to talk about that stuff ever again. Exactly. uh, Did you look at an ESOP? I mean, I know like, and I can only imagine, and I don't know without any specific numbers, but I'm assuming the spread between the financial intrinsic value that an ESOP or or even a PE firm that's purely looking at financial compared to what KPMG paid. I'm assuming that, <laughs> yeah, very large, very large Huge. spread, huh? Huge. Huge. Okay. Yeah. That, enough said then. I, 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 thought, I thought about it, but I, I also, you know, I also kind of went back to the notion of <clears throat> the growth and development of the employees. And even if it was an ESOP, it's still not going to give them the opportunity to grow, you know, have formal education. I, I work for IBM and I work for SAP and I, <clears throat> excuse me, I saw a lot of value in the leadership development programs that they had. And with an ESOP, they just still were going to get that. So I still mm-hmm. fundamentally said, I think this is just the best deal for them personally and professionally. That's awesome. But, you know, financials aside. Mm-hmm. So uh, going back to the scaling without cash. <laughs> I might just name the podcast that because it'll be clickbait for a bunch of people. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> As a, so what, what were some of the things that you did? I mean, to, to I mean, to absorb the $250,000 and you know, we don't have to get into all of the mechanics right now, but I think it's just interesting. Like what are the, the real levers to focus on? I think a lot of people focus on vanity metrics, Pete of re- top line revenue or launching products or employee headcount. And they're not looking at how all that translates into you know, transferable EBITDA. So like when you're looking at the operations, what were some of the things that you were doing? I'd say the, the first thing that we did, which I'll, it's prob- probably sounds too simplistic and kind of commonsensical, is we let everybody know what was going on in the company. That, you know, that, uh, um, again, I don't remember exactly what the employee count was, but it was a dozen and a half or something. And so we sat down and said, look, we've just been crushed. You know, they're not going to pay a quarter million dollars. We said, literally, we're going to struggle making payroll. We'll figure out a way to make it, but and we'll make it. But there's not a lot beyond this. And so we need everybody to be on board, right? And it's not in a lot of consulting firms, the consultants will kind of say, well, XYZ in sales is responsible for me being billable, right? Mm-hmm. Or whatever. And so we said, everybody owns a piece of this. Everybody owns that a piece of making themselves billable. And so if we didn't have projects, we said, then let's go figure out a way to do some, you know, do some staffing, you know, not a project project that do some staffing for a little while just to cushion the blow. And so that was the first thing we did is we just got everybody in the boat hmm, cool. helping to sell. Um, and one of the things that came out of that, you know, everybody talks about content marketing now, right? Nobody was talking about that back when we had the business. And so, we said, look, one of the best ways to to you know attract business to the company is if we start sharing our intellectual capital with people, you know, and if they're like, oh my God, if a competitor takes it or if a customer just is gonna go do this on their own, then we said both those things are gonna happen, right? And not every customer you talk to is going to hire you to do whatever, right? You you and I are doing the same thing. Somebody yeah, can go right. 
you know, do it on your own. Fine. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Like not everybody can do this and we can't take everybody out as a client anyway. So what's right. the point? And, and they're probably not a prospect. That's probably their mindset anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. And we know copy, you know, competitors are going to copy stuff, but big deal. We think that we'll track way more business than we'd ever lose through either one of those two avenues. So we started a weekly blog back then. And by the time I sold the business for our particular expertise in the SAP space, we had more traffic by tenfold than SAP as a company. Whoa. Crazy. And we got so much business out of that. And guess how much it cost us? Zero. Right. And 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 it was interesting because we would try to, you know, come up with this content calendar and all this kind of stuff and, you know, figure out and, and we just said, you know what? If, if there's some weird settings in the software, right, that nobody, that you kind of figured out, write about it. Like, just write about it. And it was crazy because we would get all this business and they're like, oh, nobody's ever solved that. Like, even the SAP guys don't even know. It, <laughs> oh, right. it, it, was, it was bizarre. Um, so that, that was kind of one just kind of very tactical thing that we did that literally didn't cost us. That over time, it literally generated business. Just people found us and they're like, you guys know this better than anybody out there, including you know, mothership SAP. And so we want to, we want to do business with you guys. So, you know, it was a combination of getting everybody on board that everybody owned generating sales for the company. Um, and even, you know, it would be things like, you know, you look at LinkedIn and you're like, Hey, you're connected to such and such. We, we had one particular consultant whose uncle was a CIO of a very large company looking for the services that we were selling. And so somebody happened to see on LinkedIn, Hey, you know, Jessica, did you know that your uncles, he's like, yeah, yeah, I kind of forgot about Uncle Henry. And we're like, you know, you really? Henry? <laughs> right? Well, whatever it was, I mean, just stupid stuff, right? And so I think, you know, the, the, you know, the necessity is the mother of innovation. Sometimes just when you're kind of desperate, you just come up with some really brilliant strategies that you just, you were kind of fat, dumb, and lazy before, and you didn't think about it, right? And mm-hmm. so... Just getting everybody on board with how do we grow the company? How do we get business? How do we do it without generating, you know, without spending cash? Mm-hmm. Um, just, and then doing that over and over and over again. And one of the things I mentioned Net Promoter Score a little bit earlier, mm-hmm. um, we did a very interesting thing and we just knew intrinsically that loyal customers will bring more customers, right? And that's kind of the whole notion behind Net Promoter Score without going mm-hmm. into explaining everything. And so we, we not only made this a key measure of the company, but we built a matrix that tied individual variable compensation to, to net promoter score. Okay. Ooh, and so like a very simple example was we would say we built this matrix that said uh, promoter. So, you, have, you know, we can talk about net promoter score, how it's all defined later, but if you want, <clears throat> but I think I th- yeah. honestly, I, w- I could just assume that the, the listeners know because it's, okay. it's been around for, for a lot. That's, a lot of people talked about it. That's kind of what I figure. So you have promoter neutral and passive or passive and uh, ne- uh, negative, right? Um, and so then we built this matrix where we said, all right, if the, if the client, if the customer thinks that the company is their promoter for the company, but you're just a bad person, right? And your score, and I'll go back to that in a second, is is a neutral or passive or, or negative. You don't get any bonus, okay? Or you get a smaller bonus. So we had this range from zero to fifteen percent of their annual salary, and it kind of. And so if they are a promoter for the company and they're a promoter for the person, then you get the full fifteen percent bonus. So we would say we would ask the question on a scale of zero to ten: How likely would you be to refer the for a, a client or a colleague, a friend or a colleague. And then the second question would be on a scale of zero to 10, how likely would you be to for Ryan to a friend Super or a colleague? Cool. And so we could then correlate these two scores, right? Hmm. And what we found happened, and it was really interesting, is let's just say these everybody's doing a project, right? And we're screwing up billing. Who does the client tell? The client tells the person on the ground, you know, hey, Jessica, like, I love you guys, but you guys keep screwing up the billing or mm-hmm. whatever it is, right? Whatever they've got an issue with, they find out. Well, before, because it would never really impacted them from a compensation perspective, they wouldn't say anything about it. Now that it affected their compensation directly, right? They yeah. would raise it up. And so it helped us improve everything in the company. And I, I got a call. We We had done this for two years running and... I ended up getting a call from the head of HR of EY, actually, who said, we heard through the net promoter score community, whatever, that you guys are tying individual compensation to this. Can we talk? And I'm like, 
Sure. And so they ended up changing their top line. Uh, it's pretty interesting. I should charge them for it, but, um, <laughs> but it was, awesome. you know, uh, you know, a lot of strategy firms were talking about, you know, in Gallup or whatever, we'll talk about the alignment between the top and the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. This had 100% alignment between the thing that was most important, the KPI that was most important to the company that literally, in fact, impacted the variable compensation of every single individual. And it just got everybody focused on the customer. That's amazing. At the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, and, it, and I think what's so interesting about how you did that is that then everything else becomes a subtask of that KPI. Right, so you don't have to focus on all these other ones if everything, because it's all, it's all under, everything else is a derivative of that. I mean, that's, that's right. really all you, yeah. Yeah. Super I mean, if you, if you fundamentally believe the concept that, you know, promoters will generate a higher net income, you know, if you, if you, which they've already empirically proven, if you kind of do get that notion, you're exactly right. We just knew, and this was, again, this is when we were kind of hurting. We said, all right. Not only is everybody responsible for bringing in business, but bringing in good business and making sure every client is, is a promoter. <laughs> and if we do that, it will, all the financial stuff will take care of itself. And it did. That's amazing. It did. So I know we're getting close here, Pete. Um, let's, uh, let's uh, get a, get to the wrap up. So before we get into what you're doing, um, let's, I love asking people what the word intentional means to them. So for you, you've been doing a lot of things on purpose, but what, what does the word intentional mean for you? So when I was 16, I wrote a personal mission statement. Crazy enough. I was a huge fan of Lou Holtz and kind of all the stuff that he talked about. And, you know, he did kind of the same thing when he was 16. And my personal mission state was to help people realize the potential they have within them, themselves. And so that's fundamentally what I'm intentional about is when I was a, a manager, you know, at various companies, when I was a leader of my own companies, there was nothing better to me than you just see this, this gem of a person and you're like, I know they have this potential. And you just figure out ways to give them those opportunities or training or whatever. And then you just see them blossom. Like to me, that's nirvana to me from a business perspective. And so that's my intention as it relates to, I just see so many entrepreneurs, whether they're going through an exit or they're trying to grow, there's so much noise about what to do and what not to do. Right. And they just can't separate the wheat from the chaff. And so, mm -hmm. you know, if you and I together and, and the folks that kind of do what we do can really help them truly grow their business, take some of the stress away and have this phenomenal exit like I did. That's everybody's better. I mean, yeah. Yep. Everybody's, everybody's better. better. So, um, and then the second part is what, where people can get in touch with you. And I'll, I'll add a little comment because you and I were talking before uh, we jumped on of whether it made sense because there's a little bit of overlap in our businesses. And honestly, it's a little bit on the training part, but like you and I, even what you said about content and intellectual property, it's like, we're doing the same thing. And like, it's such a small fee for our training. And like, and like, it's to set the stage for the next step of execution where we do fractional CFO services, but you guys do something completely different. So I want yep. you to give everybody a, a little bit of an overview of what you do and where to find you. Yeah. So we're, it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, askmyboard.com. So people can reach me at pmartin at askmyboard.com. And as Ryan said, we, we do a lot of similar things. We don't focus on the finance side at all. We focus on growth <clears throat> specifically. And so we have fractional chief growth officer services. We do a lot of sales and marketing stuff. We do really pretty much everything else around helping a business owner grow their business with the exception of the finance stuff. And we'll advise on some exit planning. We both do that, but you have a much better exit planning plan when you're growing and you're profitable <laughs> and you're generating cash and you've got loyal customers and loyal people, right? And so that's the stuff we focus on. And we'll I let you take it. care of the finance side. Pete, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Ryan. I did too. This has been super fun. Thank you, man.